for an open uh, uh, questions and answer round. Um, but I would like to first introduce another presenter. Um, unfortunately, he can't be with us um, online today, but he sent us a video statement, which we would like to display. Um, I first would like to give you some background knowledge about him. His name is Professor Dr. Rafael Luciani. He's a lay Venezuelan theologian and appointed as expert of a theological commission of a general secretariat for the Synod of Bishops. Furthermore, Professor Luciani is an expert of CELAM, which is the Latin American Episcopal Council. Professor Luciani serves as a member of a theological advisory team of a presidency of Latin American Confederations of Religious. And he holds a doctorate in theology from the Pontifical University Gregoriana in Rome. Moreover, he also has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the Salesian Pontifical University in Rome as well. He has been the director of the School of Theology at the Catholic University Andres Bellos and is also a full professor at this university. Besides, he's a professor extraordinarius at the Ecclesiastical Faculty of the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. For more than 20 years, he has taught courses on Christology, the mystery of God, the Latin American theology, and the Second Vatican Council. So we will start with this video presentation first and other afterwards we have um, the opportunity to talk to Mr. Ruiz about this um, research project which will be presented in the video now and afterwards um, yeah, have an open exchange about it. Greetings to all of you from Venezuela. Is synodality new in Latin America? I would like to speak then of the emergence of a synodal ecclesial way of proceeding in Latin America. A synodal ecclesiology has been the principal channel for receiving Vatican II in Latin America. It seeks to guarantee that what is characteristic of each local church contributes to the growth and the unity of the entire church. The post-synodal exhortation, Querida Amazonia, explains this point very well when it states everything that the church has to offer must become incarnate in a distinctive way in each part of the world. Preaching must be incarnate, spirituality must be incarnate, ecclesial structures must be incarnate. Consequently, the Latin American church is a source church that has been able to reconfigure herself, producing a regional and a communal pastoral style and creating its own ecclesial structures. Therefore, I would like to uh, share two parts in this conference. The first one regarding uh, how synodality gives life to a new ecclesial way of proceeding in our continent. And the second one, how synodality gives also life to new ecclesial structures that move from collegial structures to synodal structures. Synodality, first of all, broadens and completes collegiality. When Vatican II began, the Latin American church already had a collegial structure. The creation of Selam in 1955 had resulted in a distinctive working relationship that encouraged a permanent flow of information among all the local churches of Latin America and the Caribbean. This represented by also their bishops conference. CELAM, the Latin American Council of Bishops, organizational and consultative character, defined its first statutes as an organ for contact and collaboration among all the local churches in Latin America. With this emergence of a collaborative working method among local churches, local cler clergy gained a greater awareness of their own theological and ecclesial contribution to the church's life. Using this structure, we can remember how Pope Paul VI 
announced on January 20th, 1968, the convening of the Second General Conference of Latin American Bishops. And on August 24, 1968, he inaugurated the uh, Medellin Conference that took place at the Seminary of Medellin between August 26 and September 6 of 1968. We can remember then how Selam has played an important role in celebrating these conferences of the Episcopate that has given this uh, unified or communal way of working among the different cultures, churches, people, and ecclesial subjects in Latin America. We can speak about a situated collegiality, situated in a context. Um, sometimes when this is not uh, the way in which collegiality is exercised, we may be uh, leading uh, towards a notion of collegiality where the bishops has no portio populi day. What happened, especially during the uh, 80s and 90s, where many bishops did not have a diocese, a portio of populi day, and therefore there were, and as we uh, say in Latin America, bishops without people of God. This is something that in our context, uh, in the Latin American context, is very important. The bishop represents and is a witness of a local church, of a portion of the people of God, and therefore the pastoral experience is integrated in the collegial exercise of the episcopacy. At the same time, this way of living collegiality affiliated to a uh, the bigger church, the universal church, preserve the unity and the diversity in this communion among local churches. Medellin, according to the uh, historian of the church, Beozzo, a Brazilian that is renowned by one being one of the most important historians of the church of Latin America, he says that the exercise of collegiality has been broadened at the Medellin Conference, at the Medellin Conference. And it has to do with the assembly's working method. The method is the key in Latin America to understand the collaborative, the communal way of working that gives life to a new way of being church. Therefore, a broadened notion of collegiality one that bestows the responsibility for the life and the mission of the church on the totality of the people of God, where the bishops are understood and lived as one faithful more in the totality of the faithful that constitutes the church. A second point is how synodality in Latin America embraces practices such as listening, consulting, and decision-making. Selam had fostered this contextual praxis that moved the bishops toward a shared identity, as I have explained before. And before the Medellin conference, it already uh, existed this structure, Selam, the Latin American Council of Bishops, and they had already held 11 ordinary meetings. And also they had created 12 departments to work in a collaborative way, serving the different local churches need. This before the Second Vatican Council was already a contextual and ambiental praxis that was already there in the ecclesial culture of the Latin American church. Medellin, the conference gave another step forward because the bishops experienced ecclesiality and developed an ecclesial style that involved working together in groups with the rest of the faithful, lay people, religious, presbyters, and adopting at the same time collegial forms of action. By using these methods of working together, people came together to communicate their experiences and to analyze their concerns, to discern, to listen to each other. One has to remember the isolation that had previously prevailed 
and the lack of opportunities for meeting together in the church. But the Medellin Conference offered this new style, this new way of being church that was unprecedented because uh, it became, the method became part of the essence of the same life of the church. Therefore, at Medellin, the living out of ecclesial communion in fraternal and filial solidarity was accompanied by a mode of interacting in which it was neither judicial authority nor majority vote that guarantee concurrence with respect to judgments made and decisions taken. Uh, many call that what was happening is the phenomenon among the bishops of convergence, convergence. We can say of convergence of prophetic circumstances. That means that by reading the signs of the time, by discerning together what was happening in the continent, how the church should respond, there was an experience of this building a convergence towards pastoral actions, but not only towards new structures that could respond to these pastoral realities of the continent. Therefore, we can speak that at the Medellin conference, we find an articulation, an emergence articulation of the sensus fidelium of all the faithful and of the munus docendi of the hierarchy. Therefore, the sensus fidelium was the way in which the praxis of listening, of discerning, of working together gave the possibility to the church, to the ecclesial uh, culture of the church, to the new structures of the church, to find themselves new situations to discern and to respond to. And at the same time, the census fidelium, this practice of the census fidelium permitted to participate all the faithful in the decision making, not the taking, but the making. And this implied that bishops who were sitting in the same table, in the same room with laity, with religious, with presbyters, were elaborating together, were making together the decisions. When the assembly was gathered in a plenary uh, assembly, then the decisions that were taken were taken in convergence with those that were elaborated where the bishops had already participated. Some examples or testimony can be uh, given by some of the participants. So for example, Cardinal Landasuri Ricketts uh, from Peru says the following about the conference. He says, and I quote, during these days, we have witnessed something audacious. Though it's important, is still unclear. He recognizes that it's unclear, but something is happening. He continues, and I quote, Latin America has begun to have, to have a new way of proceeding, a new dynamic. What the experience of these days tells us is that this second general conference with its new spirit and style will begin when it concludes, will begin when it concludes. The conference is a starting point. With these words, Cardinal uh, Landasuri Ricketts recognized that the experience was uh, new for them. And at the same time, they opened up to this experience and found that something new was emerging. Another participant, uh, Mejia, Father Mejia, a witness and give testimony in the uh, conference of the following. And I quote, he says, here we live and work and pray for 15 days. The 300 people attending the conference fraternize at the table, at the liturgical celebrations and in discussions. Such leveling, horizontal leveling of cardinals, archbishops, vote religious layman and laywoman is already real progress and a good sign for the future. 
So uh, Father Mejia is recognizing these horizontal relationships that emerge from the experience of being together, from working together in the conference of Medellin. A third point about this conference that reveals is that synodality proceeds through a method of reciprocal discernment, reciprocity, completeness to each of each other. Again, Beozzo, the Latin American historian says that the novelty of this practice was etched in the working methods adopted at Medellin and also partly in the votes that were taken. Again, the method. The method implied a reception of Gaudium et Spes in Latin America and at the same time of Lumen Gentium's chapter two, the church as people of God. And this brought together a new way of proceeding situated in the context of our continent. The context where the majority were poor, where economic, political uh, situations were unstable. And in this context, the church made an option, but the option was produced and generated by the method that they followed in the way they work, listen, discern together the decisions of Medellin. We could speak about a spirit of horizontal, horizontal listening, discerning and writing. This horizontal means that they considered in the praxis themselves baptized. Baptism as the ground of this interaction meant that they could all be in the same level when they listen to each other, when they discuss, when they try to understand each other and discern what was at stake and at the same time, the decisions that were needed to be taken. In the synodal praxis then of collegiality, two dimensions can we stress of listening such as discernment and interpretation which was proper to the Episcopal College assembled and the conspiracio of all members of the people of God. In other words, there is an effort to maintain the conciliar dynamic among the one, the Pope, the many, the bishops, and all the people, the people of God, all the faithful, including the bishops within the faithful. Such an effort is possible when there is a desire to reconcile divergent positions, to reconcile uh, and recognize dissensus and construct consensus among all. Therefore, and uh, we can finish this first part saying that it was the method correlated to the census fide fidelium in practice in the conference that gave birth to a new horizontal relationship that permitted not only listening to each other, but a face-to-face -face understanding of each other, complementing each other and reaching together decisions that then, after being elaborated by all, were then taken by some, by the bishops. But being the bishops part of the decision-making made the decision taking an expression, an expression of the process that all have been living throughout the days of the conference. A second and last part, as I said at the beginning, is regarding the structures that Medellin, that the Latin American method gave birth to. In the first part, we have seen how synodality gives in our continent, a new way of being church. In this second part, how synodality gives life to communal and organic structures, communal and organic structures. So I'm going to refer as an example to some that were created along our history after the Second Vatican Council. The first one are the small Christian-based communities. Medellin reaffirmed the principle of the church's continual reformation in Unitatis Redintegratio. It was quoted in the document 
stating that all revision of church structures to the extent that they can be reformed should be done to satisfy the demands of concrete historical situations. This was a consciousness that was then written in one of the final documents of Medellin called Pastoral de Conjunto, which means a common pastoral that embraced the whole continent towards a communal way of responding through structures to the pastoral needs of the reality. Therefore, we can say that the consciousness of a new way of being church had to be translated into new structures that could express this new way of being church. As a fruit of the process, among all the new structures, we can find the small Christian-based communities. And they are recognized by the concluding document of Medellin, and this is interesting, as, and I quote, the first and fundamental ecclesial nucleus, and they should, at their own level, take responsibility for enriching and spreading of the faith, as well as for fostering the worship which is its expression. As we can say in the concluding document, these uh, small base communities were not only uh, structures that uh, function by themselves, isolated, but within an organic integration in the whole life of a local church. Therefore, the same final document says that Christians, and I quote, should be able to experience the communion to which they have been called in these base communities. That is in local and regional communities that correspond to the reality of homogeneous groups and that allow for the personal and the fraternal relationships among their members. Again, these new structures could provide horizontal relationships of fraternity and at the same time will respond to a reality where that community was living and existed. This new ecclesial context envisions the parish within the structure of these base communities. And therefore, Medellin says that the parish should become a community of communities, a community of communities. This is interesting because it brings us uh, today the same challenge of what means the institution of the parish that is today in crisis and does not respond anymore to the reality of the people, to the pastoral needs of the church. And Medellin provides this new way of understanding the parish as community of communities, a community in which we have incorporated a small base communities with leaderships, with ministries, with ways of living that correspond to each particular reality. So the first structure was the base uh, communities and the second one was the restructuring of Selam. I said at the beginning that Selam already existed uh, before Vatican II and recently in 2018, Selam began a process of synodal restructuring, synodal restructuring. And this meant that uh, the structure thought and discerned herself from the experience and the theology of synodality. So at the end of the process of the restructuring of Selam, we can find that a new administrative model was approved, reforming thus the organizational framework in three complementary components. The structures, such as areas, functions, and reporting channels, the decisions, how decisions are elaborated and taken, and the organizational culture, a new way of working that corresponded or should correspond to a synodal way of interacting. Therefore, this uh, way of being church in Latin America also permitted to rethink the structures that were already in place as a structure that needed a renewal, a reform in a synodal church. The third structure or event 
that was uh, happening uh, after the council, uh, also recently, was the Venezuelan Plenary Council. It was the first plenary council after Second Vatican II to revise all 16 documents of the council, discern them, and see them through the lens of the reality of the Venezuelan church and society. So in 1996, it was approved, and in 1998, it started a process that went uh, throughout three phases, the pre-preparatory, the preparatory, the celebratory, and the implementation phase of the Plenary Council. And the Plenary Council reached its a final recognition of the Pope in 2006. So it was a process of several years where the whole church put herself in a consultation and listening process in a discernment process of all to take decisions that could change the face and the mission of the church, rereading the documents of the Vatican II. And we have today the concluding document of the Venezuelan Plenary Council uh, in the 16th documents of the uh, Vatican II reread and applied to the Venezuelan context. In this uh, council, we can find interesting things because the representation of all lay people, of religious men and women, of presbyters, of all bishops of Venezuela were even in interaction with theologians of different tendencies and non-Catholics were part of the daily life of listening, discerning, and elaborating decisions. There were more than 250 people involved officially. And in each day, the discussions in this horizontal way, in the same table, permitted to, again, as happened in Medellin, to overcome this pyramidal and clerical vision that was in the Venezuelan church and a little by little was transformed through this interaction a mutual understanding of the people that participated. Then the elaborations that were made by these groups where the bishops participated were then approved in the plenary assembly where the bishops took the final decisions. And the Venezuelan Plenary Council created three new ecclesial structures such as the first one, the National Pastoral Council. That means a council that orients and that provides orientation to the whole church integrated this council by lay religious presbyters and bishops. The second structure is the National Pastoral Institute in charge of the formation vision of the church and the third one is the National Pastoral Assembly. This is an assembly that was uh, created in order to have a permanent consultation and listening process in the Venezuelan church. Today, we just had the second uh, assembly where the topic was the reform of parishes as community of communities. The fourth structure created in Latin America recently is the Ecclesial Conference of the Amazon, SEAMA. This is another ecclesial synodality a structure that in Latin America permitted a new way of understanding the interaction among the faithful and the decision making and taking in the whole church. This creation of the conference is a response to the call made by the Amazon synodal process to create as in Querida Amazonia says, a pan-Amazonian ecclesial communications network that encompasses the various means used by the particular churches and other ecclesial bodies. This new synodal structure and way of working in Seama can be seen by the choice of its name that it is not an episcopal conference but an ecclesial conference. That means that all the subjects, the ecclesial subjects, participate in a horizontal way, listening, discerning, listening, and elaborating decisions together. 
and not only individuals, but also institutions that make life in the Latin American church are part of the board of SEAMA, such as CLAR, the Confederation of Religious Men and Women, or also REPAM and all the other institutions that have like Caritas life in the Latin American church. So this way of proceeding permitted that this new structure was thought in a synodal way of working. And the last, and with this example I end, is the structure that we recently lived last year in 2021, which is the creation of a new synodal institution in Latin America officially, and this is the Ecclesial Assembly of Latin America and the Caribbean. It's a first experience of an institution that brings synodality into life institutionally speaking. The assembly was developed uh, in different stages that began by the listening process. And this listening process was done throughout uh, the whole continent. The first stage of consultation and listening permitted the whole people of God to uh, be consulted and to give freely their opinion. Then the second stage was the celebration and the discernment in common that took place in Mexico on November 2021, where the discernment uh, permitted to elaborate the uh, new pastoral orientations that were proposed by the, this ecclesial event. And the third phase is the synthesis elaborated by the team of theologians and pastoralists of Selam, and at the same time discerned with the bishops of Latin America. And this led to a new systematization of pastoral orientations for the continent. Thousands of people were consulted and participated physically and online. And this new synthesis uh, represents how we are reading our current signs of the times and trying to respond from new institutions and structures in a synodal key to the reality of the church and the society today. This gathering of the ecclesial assembly, it's interesting that as an ecclesial institution and not an episcopal institution, the majority of the people were lay people or institutions that represented different uh, uh, ways uh, of working and uh, being in the society. And only a 20% of the participants were bishops, only a 20%. Therefore, we find ourselves in this a transition where collegiality is being discerned in the light of synodality. In conclusion, the emergence of a synodal ecclesiality has signified a reception of the council that allowed the Latin American church to position herself as a source church, a source church. That means a church that had not only created a collegial form of continental interaction, but had also inaugurated, inaugurated in a spirit of being and of working a new method that gave rise to a synodal way of proceeding as part of its identity. The reception of the council's ecclesiology of the people of God and the ecclesiology of the local churches have been key to understanding the emergence of a practice and a style that has given identity and has produced an ecclesiogenesis to which today we can say that in Latin America, the church is living a transition towards a new way of proceeding, new institutions inspired by a synodal style of being, of working, a synodal style that will represent a new phase in the coming future for this church. Therefore, to end, 
I quote the preparatory document of the Synod on Synodality that says in number 27, if it is not embodied in structures and processes, the style of synodality easily falls from the level of intentions and desires to that of rhetoric. While synodal processes and events, if not animated by an adequate style, become an empty formality. Therefore, we can say that the ability to imagine a different future of the church will depend, as the preparatory document says, largely on the decision to begin practicing processes of listening, dialogue, and community discernment in which each and every person can participate and contribute. Because as the classic principle says, what affects everyone should be dealt and approved by all. Thank you so much. Lieber Herr Professor Luciani, herzlichen Dank für diese Botschaft, für dieses Statement. Thank you so much, Professor Luciani, for your statement. It is my impression that you mentioned many things that uh, can be dealt with on a global level and that uh, might be very important also for Germany and the Synodal Path. We realize that in our process, um, well, we are not in the middle of the process, but at the very beginning of the process. Mr. Ruiz, I'm so delighted to have you here with us on board. You are available for our questions. Uh, welcome also on my part, and I would like to start right away with the first question by Mr. Fleichtinger. He says that, of course, um, we uh, speak about a continental or national level, but questions of decision making has to be broken down on the local level. Was that part of it? Or when it came to the implementation of a synodal church, I heard about the uh, source church. Um, um, is, how, how, can, you, can you speak about the context of that? Yes, uh, sure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, well, actually, there's uh, a big problem, I guess. It's not only in Latin American church, but also in other continental spaces. It's how to, to implement this synodality process in local structures. I, I think in, in Latin America, in some of the dioceses I, I was working with, um, it's very uh, demanding the ways of how to, to involve lay actors, priests, religious actors, in this more local and based process. Because in Latin America, for instance, we have been used to uh, work from the more in the ecclesial based communities that have a very different dynamics from what it means now synodality. Because in a moment, some of these ecclesial communities were uh, set apart from the from the, the pastoral, pastoral plans and, and that kind of things. Uh, but now the, the big challenge is how to make this synodality experience as, a, as an ecclesial experience uh, for every member of the church. I mean, in the parish, in the local communities, and then in the dioceses, our dioceses, and how it's not only a process on the big church, on the big structure of the church, like, for instance, Raphael has just explained, about the cell plant, but how it could be also implemented. Uh, um, and this is a, a, also a, a problem in the Diocese of Lima, where I'm from, because uh, it's required a very important uh, uh, pre-step that is as a church members, as a theologians and, and, and more active members of the church, we need to, to prepare lay people priest to be part of synodality uh, process synodality path because people have to be aware of their of the of the meaning of their baptism of the meaning of being part of the tria monera and i wonder if, if how many of 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 the catholics of daily life catholics are aware of this uh, 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 rights if you want to say that war of of this 
a gift that receive uh, that they receive through the baptisms and what does it mean to be member of the church so i think a pre-step that we have to to take before uh, uh, the implementation of any uh, uh, structures even in in the local churches to to educate uh, our our communities to educate our parish members in this new theology that make them aware of the importance of be part of the church and be part of this uh, 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 making process, uh, 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 making decision process, um, how the, their collaboration is, is really important for the church, for the life of the church in, in the actual context. Thank you. Lassen Sie mich an der Stelle noch einmal nachfragen. At this point, let me ask one more time. When you talk about lay participation, it sounds a bit like a toothless tiger. The question that has come up is that you have often mentioned speaking from face to face on an equal footing. But how much of that is listening? And how much of that actually means implementing? So even at a precipitative, precipitative participational level, uh, at the end of the day, the bishops take the decision. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. We have, uh, for instance, in Peru, uh, we had an experience in the South uh, Andes, the, uh, we used to call it like the Church of the South Andes. Uh, it's, it's a very famous, important moment in the church in the Peruvian church history and um, when I interviewed some of the actor priests and lay uh, uh, people that were part of these uh, pastoral teens they have a very beautiful uh, uh, memories of the uh, uh, meetings that they have as a team with the presence of bishops and prelates because it was a, a, a missionary area not only diocese but also uh, uh, predators and the, their memories are very uh, interesting, as a, 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 if, if we can say that this as a locus theologicus of the synodality experience. They remember how the assembly was uh, uh, was chaired by a lay man or a lay woman or a priest. It, it depends in each moment, and everyone have the same time to ex to express their minds. And the same time to to just to to intervene or to correct or to just to add some information or or or, or anything, and um, all were in the same foot in the in the assembly. Um, they also uh, remember the uh, commissions that they they uh, installed, they formed during these assemblies of of this uh, pastoral area. And how in this uh, process the bishop were part of these uh, uh, commissions, and they were also involved in in the in the in the uh, uh, making process decision. Uh, of course, the last or the 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 the, the main decision, the pastoral letter that that produced this kind of assemblies, were also collaborative. So, and they many of these pastoral letters. There was a very famous one of 1989. If if my mind is is, is, is my memory is not uh, 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 on me, um, when the the bishops signed that the old uh, bishop signed the, the this pastoral letter that was written by the whole assembly, all the members that were elected by the assembly that were lay women, lay men religious uh, women religious priests etc so we have we had an experience in Peru. unfortunately this experience was dismantled during the uh, 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 late uh, 1980s and, and during the the 1990s and we only have now the memories and the and, and sign of the archives uh, of, of this experience but uh, we already had some of this kind of 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 uh, uh, living uh, memories. And this show a way of how can be prepared for instance, a pastoral letter or this kind of uh, uh, daily life documents of the local church. So it happened in, in, this, in the case of Peru. Uh, and I, I'm very confident that we can go back to this kind of uh, uh, meaningful and, and if, if we can say, 
a, a spiritual experience, conspiratio, as, as Lumen uh, Dave Edwin says about the, 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 the meaning of the, the church, that, the whole church that received the, the, the mystery of God. So we have this experience, and I guess we need to go back to this kind of, of, of experience. And let me go to my previous intervention. Again, these lay women, lay men that were part of these assemblies, they were very well educated in theology, in pastoral. So we need also to be aware of, of our tria uh, munera, our the importance of our baptism, uh, uh, to be part of, of these, these decisions, mainly mm -hmm. in, in the current context. Yes, thank you. Geben Sie mir noch die Zeit für zwei kurze Fragen und ich freue mich. Give me the time for two more brief questions and I hope that we can have very brief responses as well as time's running away. First question is, we do have a Latin American Pope who initiated this process of synodality. He's trying to fill the concept of synodality, not just with words, but also with actions and the experience of being a church in Latin America, the experiences of Medellin are certainly a factor in that. What would you say are three central elements that he may have learned from the international synodal process? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I will say in historical terms that uh, this Latin American experience is also shaped by the necessity of, of the lack of priest. Uh, that's one of, of the things. But this uh, fortunate thing, if, if, if you allow me to say, uh, made that, that, that the lay people were uh, really considered of a, of a church actors. And um, for the for three or, or thinking in, in three elements for the synodality process, I think one of them is the, the importance of the, or the awareness of the tria munera of the lay people. I think one of the, of, of the main discussions now is how the lay people uh, is also involved in the, uh, uh, in the uh, munus uh, regendi, in the, in the labor or, or in, the, in the task of governing the church. How does, what does it mean uh, as, as a church uh, uh, in the structure of the church? I think what, this is one of the main topics to discuss for synodality, what does it mean in theological and canonical terms, or how canon law could express these theological reflections? Uh, a second aspect is the importance of women. We cannot be a church that uh, is uh, keeps uh, their position of 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 church uh, of of the women outside the church. And we cannot continue saying that uh, the that, that women have a special place in the church, but we, we would like to know what is this special place. And, and probably uh, uh, female diaconate, it's a very important step also in this discussion. And it's allow me to the, to the third uh, uh, question, and is the role or the theology of the uh, uh, ordained ministry. What does it mean to be an ordained ministry in a more synodal church if we have or we should rethink the munus regendi, the munus sanctificandi, that, uh, that are the, the most important uh, uh, things that have to be rethinked in a more synodal church? So I think this is the three main topics. And um, some of them were uh, deal in very uh, in, in, Urgence, urgency uh, conditions in, in the South Andes, for instance, in Peru, when lay people just have to, to marry it or have to assume some of these governing uh, uh, issues, for instance, or where women have a very important place in the church. Without asking, there aren't enough uh, priests. Uh, so some of this experience came from, from, from also from the history and from the daily life uh, church experience, but they need to be reflected in theological and even canonical terms.
Herr Ruiz, ich sehe, da ist ein ganzer Erfahrungsschatz dabei, aber auch einige Herausforderungen. Mr. Ruiz, as I see, there's a host of experience that we can benefit from, not just here in, so, not just here in Europe, but around the world. But you did say that it is still a process, even in Latin America, that we have to continue this process and carry it over to canon law and theology. But with that, I would like to enter the break. Now, normally we had envisaged the break to end at two o'clock Central European time, but um, because because of the delay, we will now have to be back at the end of the next full hour to look at the situation in large cities. If you look at the if you look at the program and consider what we've been talking about this morning, we wondered how synodality can function as a structure. But the afternoon session is dedicated to looking at big cities and large metropolitan areas. So at two o'clock. German time uh, in about 40 minutes. We'll see you back here.